the children uh, from the middle school to uh, draw a tree. So this is a tree advisory board. And I love trees and uh, they help us to breathe oxygen and they take the carbon out of the air. So if we had more trees, uh, we'd have better air and less carbon. But if we don't have any carbon, we don't have any green, <coughs> green trees either. So you have to have both. So. Are any of these jurors? So, thank you, Mayor and Council. So the City of Media Springs is a 14-year recipient of Tree City USA, which is the National Arbor Day Foundation's program. And uh, to help us with that and to get knowledge to our exciting and encouraged youth, um, they have annually participated in what trees mean to them. And this year, the theme of that competition was trees are tough. So if you each would just say your name in a little bit, just a quick moment about your piece, that would be awesome, and your grade. Um, my name's Noel, and I'm in fourth grade, and I drew this art because it reminded me of the beach. Hi, my name is Jasmine, and I really didn't know really what to draw when it came up to draw with trees, but I would always remember that I'd always loved drawing sunsets, so I did a palm tree with drawing a sunset. <laughs> My name is Kira Trafficanti. I'm in eighth grade, and I drew mine because I thought it would just be a really pretty scenery. Well, thank you all, and because of your participation, um, this helps us keep the City of Lena Springs part of a very important program to our community. So uh, you, our youth, are contributing to that, and we want to thank you and your school, Media Springs Charter School, and your teacher is here as well. I think Ms. Baluda was here and some of your representatives. So thank you all for participating, and if you ladies would like to come be in the, be in the picture, we have someone who can take a picture with them too. So any of the teachers want to come forward with them. Okay, so <clears throat> before we get started, Mike, our new city, uh, our city clerk, really put together a very nice polish on uh, our version of the proclamation, and I was going to allow him to read it, being new, number one, and number two, uh, sometimes these proclamations, if you ever watch the city meetings, are kind of long and cumbersome. So having Mike read them for us then allows us to just say the nice part that we wanted to say. And um, I think that's how I'm going to do this. And you know, if it's precedent setting, then great. If not, that's OK, too. So Mike, with that being said, would you like to start off by reading the proclamation? And the mayor gives you permission to do all this. Thank uh, you. Of course. Thank you. Whereas on October 1st, 1962, President John F. Kennedy signed a bill designating May 15th as Peace Officers Memorial Day in the week in which May 15th falls as National Police Week. And whereas May 15th is designated as Peace Officers Memorial Day in recognition of fallen officers and their families, and U.S. flags shall be flown at half staff. And whereas 
it is important that all citizens know and understand the responsibility, responsibilities, hazards, and sacrifices of their law enforcement officers. And whereas National Police Week is an opportunity to come together to express support for our law enforcement officers and to show our pride for the selfless courage they demonstrate in the face of danger and for the compassion they show to our citizens and visitors. And whereas the professionalism, dedication, and courage exhibited by the members of the Lee County Sheriff's Office, Bonita Springs Community Policing Unit throughout the performance of their demanding duties deserve our utmost respect, support, and gratitude. Now therefore, Mayor Rick Steinmeier, on behalf of the City Council, does hereby proclaim May 14th through 20th, 2023 as National Police Week in the City of Bonita Springs, and the City Council publicly salutes the members of the, City, of the Lee County Sheriff's Office, Bonita Springs Community Policing Unit, and of all law enforcement agencies across our state and nation. Thank you, Mike. I, I hate to give my back to the crowd, but I just kind of wanted to look over here at you guys and, and just let you know that we appreciate you. And as you know, uh, are the two new folks here? Two newest? The two new two newest? Yeah, we have one right here. Yeah. Deputy. Could you raise your hand? The two new uh, two new guys? Oh, welcome. Yeah, welcome. Yeah. Welcome. So these are the first two. <laughs> when we started the process of trying to expand the force, these were the first two that we got. So welcome to Benita Springs. And... Thank you guys for what you do. I, I won't get into the details, but I'll say that uh, you all helped me with a with an issue, a very significant issue, and the detectives uh, cracked the case in record time like you have. Uh, many of the worst crimes that happen, you guys have been so receptive and so quick to respond and get things done and get us, uh, you know, we are in over, on our 11th year consecutive crime rate reductions and we're running this the city uh, you know with not not the lar not the full staff that they should actually have and you guys are still hitting those numbers you're keeping us safe our property values are going up that isn't by accident that's because people feel safe here downtown 10 years ago wasn't a place like it is now and a place like what it's going to be none of that's possible without you all so mm -hmm. from the bottom of my heart thank you from on behalf of Nita Springs and all of my colleagues, we salute you, we appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very, very much. Uh, Mayor and City Council, again, thank you very much for, for the honor uh, and uh, the proclamation. We appreciate it very much. And to the community of Benita Springs, on behalf of Sheriff Marcino and the men and women of the Lee County Sheriff's Office, and specifically our Benita Springs community policing team, we thank you all very much for your support. We have you know, worked very hard throughout the year. Of course, we had Hurricane Ian, where a lot of people were affected, um, and we came together as one community. Uh, our men and women of the Lee County Sheriff's Office came together, did as much as they could, uh, and we've actually been able to go ahead and recover and recover well. I understand there's a lot of us that are still recovering, uh, but of course it helped in uh, that um, you know transition. But we are here uh, for you. Uh, we come to work each and every day dedicated to go ahead and make Benita Springs a safer city for each and every one of you. And again, we appreciate all your support. So God bless, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, City Council, if you would like to join them, this Please. is your community policing unit. Come, come down there, I think. Oh, stand, stand behind you. Yeah. Can you trust us to do that, guys? <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you. Oh, Lord. <coughs> okay. <coughs> okay. 
Okay, great. <clears throat> Oakland Drive, who's going to present that? Who starts out with community development? Staff will give an early presentation and then uh, the applicant will give their main presentation. You can hear from staff more fully afterwards. Um, this is a quasi-judicial hearing, so I will ask Mike to read the... I'm sorry, public comment yeah. on agenda items. Oh, sorry. And, and did we do roll call? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Public comment on the agenda. This is not for either of the two land use items that are here. Uh, if you are commenting on a truck drive through, okay. that's what we will probably pass tonight. <coughs> is involved with right. just the ordinance. From there, we will go to a resolution as to how and where and how we're going to do all this yeah, the stuff. Truck, the truck drive-through will also will have its own public hearing as well. I just wanted to In introduce future, myself. Right? My name is Kyle Moran. Uh, I first moved to Medina Springs 30 years ago, and I just wanted to thank this council and staff and City Hall for all you do to make our city better and it's a lot because for far too long our city was the most ignored and overlooked corner of lee county considered just a pass through just a spot on the map between fort myers and naples but people in this building have made consistent improvements across the board over decades You've built safer and more complete streets. You responded quickly and effectively to natural disasters. You're pursuing key wa stormwater projects to make us more resilient. You've built new roadways like Imperial Parkway. You've prevented community destroying overpasses being put in place by FDOT and, and Collier County. You've revitalized our downtown, bringing community commerce and charm back towards that blighted area, supporting events across our city and in our downtown, events like Celebrate Benita, about Memorial Day that's on the, the docket for today, National Day of Prayer, the 4th of July, Christmas events, and you're investing in a great community policing program, that the deputies of which were recognized here today, and you're today fulfilling a prior promise uh, to Benetians for more deputies to keep us safe. And not a single one of those items that I mentioned was easy. They were all hard. And most of them weren't just hit the button and forget about it. It was making sure that we stayed on top of the improvements to preserve those improvements. But it was necessary, and it was worth it for all Venetians. So Benita Springs isn't to be ignored or overlooked any longer. We're large and we're growing. We're a beautiful melting plot, pot. Sure, we have a lot of folks here that count many generations in their family, but we have a huge percentage of people that chose to live in Benita Springs, including a vibrant immigrant community. It's a very special place. It's over 60,000 people strong and growing. In fact, and even though for most of our history we've been overshadowed by Naples, Naples is now just a fraction of our size. So. It's also important we stop subsidizing Naples. Every day, Venetians travel to Naples. Both customers uh, and workers travel to Naples to do business with one, of an, one another. There should be more shops and restaurants here so we, we keep that commerce here. Every day, we let thousands of workers drive trucks from up north, from Cape Coral and Lehigh, through our downtown. That damages our downtown. We should keep it better. We need to build that stronger commerce and community here. And thankfully, you're on the verge, as you mentioned, Mr. Mayor, of designating downtown pedestrian friendly. And that basic improvement is absolutely necessary. It's absolutely necessary because hundreds of other cities do it. And it's absolutely necessary because it is plainly spelled out in the comprehensive plan of the city. So let's follow the good example of others. Let's continue to improve our great and growing, vibrant city. And let's simply follow that comp plan. Like a lot of the other improvements we made to the city, it may or may not be easy, but it's worth it for Venetians. Thank you again. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. 
quick, we just quickly have a picture. Matthew was a few minutes late uh, for Arbor for Arbor, Arbor Day. Day for Arbor Day. <laughs> Come on, let's go visit Maris. Hello, Matthew. Hey. <laughs> Good job, guys. Laura, can you Good just job, pass Matthew. me the microphone so he can just say his name and Miss Taylor? Which one is Matthew's picture? He has it right here. It's beautiful, Matthew. Can we see it, Matthew? Can you show them? Oh, wow. wow. Good job. I saw Good that one. Job. <laughs> Do you want to say a little bit about your picture? Tell us why you drew what you drew. I drew my picture because I wanted to show that Arbor Day was a day to sell my trees, and so so we can take care of our trees to plant m more trees and stuff. <laughs> this is uh, second second grade Matthew. Thank you. You got to take it on two phones. Can you take it? Did you already get this? Eric? I think he did, Mom. You want to come up for the photo? Mom, you want to come dad. up? Dad. <laughs> Mom and Dad. <laughs> Chris, did you need me to take one? Is that it? Is this the painter? Yeah. Okay, and you got yours. Okay. Good job, Dad. We're going to take two pictures. To, uh, we are now up to the zoning and land use items. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, what I'd like to do, Mayor, before um, before uh, Mr. Sheffield reads reads the reads the um, ordinance, I would like to swear in everyone for both the Oakland Commercial PUD and for the special exceptions for the condominium warehouse. Would you please rise, raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Especially you, John Dahmer. <laughs> this is a second reading of a zoning ordinance of the city of Bonita Springs, Florida, considering a request to amend zoning ordinance 16-07 for the Oakland commercial plan development with the addition of a master concept plan, amended conditions, and an amended schedule of uses located at 27971 Oakland Drive, Bonita Springs, Florida, and providing for an effective date. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Mary Zizzo for the record. This is just that, a public hearing for a plan development amendment at 27971 Oakland Drive. This amendment incorporates a new master concept plan and amended schedule of uses and does allow for a temporary time frame of open storage prior to um, permanent occupancy at that site. Um, the applicant is here that can make a presentation. The staff recommends approval as conditioned in the staff report. And if you have any questions or would like a more thorough presentation, we'd be happy to do so. What are the conditions, quickly? Uh, so the main priority for the applicant was the open storage. So they have 65 <coughs> months from the date of local development order to do that open storage use. Um, at the time of local development order for the open storage, they will be putting in the sidewalk and improvements to Oakland Drive that are required for development. Very good, thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Stacy Hewitt with Banks Engineering. I'm a certified planner with Banks Engineering. And um, I also have the applicant team here with me, the applicant representatives, Dan Stouter, um, the engineer, Brent Addison, and the landscape architect, Jared Prentice of David Dem Jones and Associates. Um, we do have a presentation if you would like it or we are available for questions, um, whatever the council would prefer. I'd like motion to, make, to approve. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve it. Thank you. I, I would like to see the presentation. Okay. Okay. Presentation, please. Again, 
again, the staff has recommended approval of the request and the zoning, <coughs> zoning board unanimously recommended approval also. The site is 2.15 acres on the west side of Oakland Drive. It is in the northwest quadrant of the I-75 interchange. It is within the interchange commercial future land use category and it is set back approximately 580 feet from um, it's on the north side of Bonita Beach Road. It is located behind um, existing hotel gas stations and fast food uses and it's adjacent to the flea market and older mobile homes in the area. The site remains vacant, although the zoning for commercial on this site has been approved and in place since 1997. It is tucked back and away from the main road, so it has been a difficult site, but we believe the amendment is going to stir redevelopment on this site and in the area. Um, it is within the rede redevelopment overlays, which were created for favorable conditions for revitalization and redevelopment of areas. And it's also intended to provide incentive driven alternatives. Um, we are in the Bonita Beach Road corridor overlay. Um, there is a, a line, the green dashed line in front of you is the, um, the outline of the overlay. Um, and as far as notices and um, neighborhood coordination meetings, um, there were two of the immediate adjacent property owners. We did receive and are in the packet two letters of support from immediately adjacent neighbors, and we didn't receive any objections from the neighbors. Um, there is one a letter of support attached to the staff report also from a potential tenant for the open storage portion of the site. And also um, there was one letter of opposition on Carpenter Lane included um, that was provided to staff, but they did not reach out to the applicant directly and were not included. They did not show up at the neighborhood information meeting. Um, the open storage is appropriate at this location. It's the only historical use that's ever happened on the property. And it's also the only interest that's been shown so far to date in the site. Um, the site was previously permitted for this use and found consistent and compatible with the surrounding areas. It is a very low traffic generator and um, the location near the interstate and set back behind these uses from Bonita Beach Road, um, it is an appropriate location. The interstate zone of the overlay is the only zone that allows open storage and, and requested by special exception. We're doing the plan development process, which is actually a more rigorous review um, than the special exception, so it still complies with that requirement. And the staff and the applicant do um, agree on the conditions. Um, when we originally did come in for the application, we're, we're, we're requesting the open storage use, not with a limited basis, but we have worked closely with staff to come up with these conditions and are in agreement with them. Um, some other benefits of the request is there is a long-term local ownership and investment on the site. The previous time frames for the open storage that were included in the zoning conditions did not set a predictable time frame and prevented the property to being leased, and it's, which is why it's still vacant today. The proposed conditions remove that barrier and will allow a predictable time frame to secure a lease a minimum of five years from the date of occupancy and the business strategy is to provide funding to facilitate a phase two development. So the open storage would be the first phase on the site and then for phase two that open storage would be removed and a permanent use with a building would be proposed. And this would encourage um, redevelopment as desired by the city in the overlay. It also increases um, safety and ultimately provide employment opportunities for the area. Um, phase one will include a 284 linear foot vital extension of Oakland Drive along the entire property frontage. Um, it'll provide a six foot wide sidewalk with a landscape buffer and a shaded bench or other streetscape amenity for the neighborhood. Um, and it'll also be <coughs> connecting the high density residential to the commercial uses to the south. And it'll also provide a um, further connection to the city's Carpenter Lane Park, which is also to the north of this site. Um, infill development, um, this will allow infill development, increasing the tax base for this city. And just for reference, I did not point that up on the 
on the map at Carpenter Lane Park is up in the um, northwest corner of this map at the end of Oakland. This is the, well, the master concept plan from the latest zoning amendment. Um, it was a very um, vague plan that was, um, it had, was previously approved. And at that time, open storage was limited to three years from the zoning approval with an option to extend for a two-year extension. But um, the time frame was not enough and not secure enough for the applicant to get um, uh, someone to lease the property. Um, at that time, the last zoning only required Oakland to be paved to five feet north of the driveway that was on the south for the open storage use. So we have agreed um, through this process to pave Oakland to our north property line, which is more than what was previously required. Also, this master concept plan only required 20% open space, and the proposed master concept plan provides 30% open space. The first phase would be for open storage and to construct the sidewalk and the road and the um, south access point and the buffering along there. And then phase two would be removal of the open storage use and the site plan that you see before you. These are some just some aerials of the site showing the existing, um, the pavement for Oakland goes just south of our property line today. Um, and we will, again, be extending that. And uh, the picture number four there is of the Carpenter Lane Park area. Um, I, that Actually, concludes. this was zoned by Lee County in 97. Yes. Uh, if I wanted to put a mobile home in there today, could I do that? No. No, okay. As a matter of fact, just in that note, um, the residential uses in that area, the mobile home uses in that area, wouldn't be allowed by the land use category that it's in today. So those would not be able to come in without a, a planned development zoning. But it's, it's, it's turning into a, a more commercial area. Correct. That's why it was planned that way. Yes. By Lee County. And it's in the city's uh, interchange commercial future land use category, that it, whole area. It was originally something before Lee County changed it. Yes, it was agricultural before Lee County approved this, the commercial plan development. And then the city did something to it? It has been amended twice by the city, um, in 09 and in 2016. What, what kind of changes was it? The first amendment um, was for the commercial, for the interim open storage and then it had um, commercial uses or hotel or restaurant use. Um, that was in the 09 resolution. And then in 16, they reduced height, reduced square footages, and um, came up with the master concept plan that was before you with some, um, with various other minor changes. But each time, each step, they reduced height and intensity on in negotiations with conditions on those approvals and we're not changing those height and um, use restrictions for the second phase okay again i'd like to make a motion to approve this second <coughs> i have a question did i have a second you, you have a second you have a second okay yes uh, why is it, I'm trying to understand why the open storage is going to work this time when it didn't work in the past. You mentioned that it was the plan was amended in 09 to include an open storage concept. Was that the same idea to have open storage and then find people who would lease the property? I'm not certain about the 09 amendment, but the current property owner purchased it in 2016. And the, the hopes at that time were, the conditions that were included in 2016 were from zoning approval, which put a time limit from zoning approval, not accounting for permitting time, and not that it didn't allow a time frame for a lease, somebody to sign a lease and know when they would be able to, how long they would be able to be on the property. We worked very closely with staff to come up with wording to speed up the permitting, and now there is a five-year use time that would allow us to secure a lease for the property. So how did you get to a five-year use time? Um, if, I, if I could, I'd let the applicant speak to that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good evening, members of the council. For the record, I'm Stan Stouter. I'm the managing member of the LLC making the application. 
the uh, the property could have been continuously leased from 2016 till today. However, the hurdles imposed by the zoning were too much to overcome. The time frame that that has been agreed to by the staff and by the zoning board is largely predicated upon giving me, the applicant, enough time to recapture some of my capital for having to put in the road, the sidewalk, all the buffering. It gives me a chance to get some wind in my sails again so that I can then move forward with the second phase, which I would hope to put a building there. To that point, we have on the record a letter from a prospective tenant that would be uh, that would be on the property today had I not had these other requirements such as the road and the sidewalk etc and in the application I am mandated to perform certain duties such as apply for a, a development order by a number of days secure it by a number of days do the improvements by the number of days and it is my full unabated attention to execute those improvements as timely as the city can move those requirements through their process. So are you saying the city has put restrictions on the development such that you've not been able to develop the property as you like? The past restrictions were, I had to extend the road, I had to do excessive buffering. There were heritage trees that have been addressed through the uh, tree advisory board. All of those things take time and, and permitting, and those were impediments to immediate occupancy. If, if you might recall, in, in any time there's been any type of a disaster relief, this property prior to those improvements being required was always filled. And there's a demand for the, the space today just by having some place for these emergency relief workers to put their equipment. But the greater demand in the longer term is for landscape maintenance companies that will serve gated communities and as opposed to having to drive down the already suffocating Benita Beach Road, they can get from here right to the interstate, abating the traffic on Benita Beach Road. Does that suffice, sir? You know, I guess my, my problem is, is that we, we end up with projects in the city that we have variances on and, and we have land development orders that never get built. Uh, Bonita Village, uh, the hotel west of Bonita Village, and I'm just trying to figure out, you know, is this something that's actually going to happen or is this something that you might come back in, say, four or five years and say, gee, I got to submit another master concept plan because I wasn't able to get this to work out. I can't predict what's going to happen in four or five years, but I can tell you that the application mandates that I deliver these improvements for the city at my expense within a set amount of days or my approve, my, the approval that you're about to make tonight and hope uh, goes away. Well, could I ask staff to, to expand on that a little bit, how that works? Yes, so our intention was that this wasn't a project that does come back to you a few years later with the same request. So if they do in fact want to do self-storage, they have to apply within, I believe it's 90 days for the local development order approval. And they need to have the, um, they have 65 days from the date of that, 65 months from the date of that approval to do their open storage activities. So therefore, um, in the previous approvals, they had two years to do the open storage, then could come back in for another two years of approval. This is a set duration. If you're going to do it, you're going to do it now. Um, and then the property will have permanent brick and mortar infrastructure built. <coughs> a question for vote? Actually, I have one question. Uh, if I may, Mr. Mayor. Yes, yes, Desi. Why the two phases? Uh, logistically, I don't care. I'm just curious, logistically, why the two phases instead of being a doing what you ultimately want to do from the get and applying that way instead of going through this process, I getting approved and then doing it again. They asked for a permanent open storage use and we don't find that use appropriate on a permanent basis. Therefore, we said we would feel, um, we would feel that five years or the 65 month duration is appropriate during this time as the area has not fully developed, but ultimately the Bonita Beach Road corridor would like to see commercial uses there and that development would help further that. 
to help the uh, property owner recover some of his expenses. And that as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, these people aren't made of money. Uh, can we call for a vote, roll call? We need, a, we need public, open up the public Public hearing. comment, please. Not that I expect. Uh, roll call, please. Council Member Purden. Aye. Council Member Carr. Aye. Mayor Steinmeier. Aye. Council Member Corey. No. Council Member Fullick. Aye. Council Member Forbes. Councilmember Bogaz. Hi. Thank you, sir. Okay. The East Springs Motor Condo. Read the title. No, this one. This one doesn't require. Title. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> you got to keep these really strange rules. Keep you on your toes. Okay. Good. Good evening again, Mary Zizzo. For the record, um, this is a special exception request to have motor condos at two eight zero one zero zero two zero Performance Lane. Um, the way our code defines. Car condos, they are categorized as self-storage and therefore within the Bonita Beach Road corridor overlay, a special exception is required. Um, zoning board has recommended approval, staff recommends approval with the conditions outlined and the applicant <coughs> does agree. If you would like to hear a presentation from the applicant, they are here. I have a question, what are any special, uh, I think they, do they have to be besides by right? <coughs> Can you re rephrase the question? Uh, is there any special thing that they have to do? Self-storage facilities have their own set of supplementary district regulations and therefore there is extensive buffering that's required. Um, they have to put in a 30-foot landscape buffer and then naturally with Chapter 3 requirements, they have to put in the sidewalks and standard development requirements. Uh, do they have to do anything with the school? So they have actually worked with the school, um, and so this development will further the pedestrian interconnections there, so there'll be sidewalks all around the property. And they worked with the school so that um, there is an appropriate space for the crosswalk to occur and that those students can safely get to Racetrack Road. Um, also, with the traffic patterns, they've asked the school to tell them what would be best for uh, location access so they've put the entrance and the e exit to the property where we've asked them to in accordance with the traffic patterns and the peak hours do not interfere with the school or the okay, local now, the condominium is, has many owners but is it open 24 hours a day is there a security guard there are no hours um, there are 31 units and it will have a gate you can ask the applicant if they plan to have security there what when, are, when is it available to the owners? They are owned, so they're able to occupy them at any time, 24 hours, but they are not dwelling units. Therefore, they are not permitted to live within these units. It's they can come and go at any time, yeah. day or night. Yes. And they're individually owned, they're individually taxed. Okay. That is how they propose them. Is this a condominium association, a homeowner type thing? Correct. There will be a property owners association. So you can sell them. And then they're responsible for the maintenance. Sounds good to me. Motion to approve. Second. <coughs> Public hearing. Any other comment? Public comment? Any public comment? Roll call, please. Council Member Carr. Aye. Mayor Steinmeier. Aye. Council Member Corey. Aye. Council Member Fullick. Aye. Council Member Forbes. Council Member Bogaz. Aye. Council Member Purden. Aye. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Just want to say thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. Enjoy, enjoy. Okay. I got that taken care of. Uh, I guess we're at the consent agenda. Motion to approve. Second. Okay. Uh, roll call. Mayor Steinmeier. Aye. Council Member Corey. Aye. Council Member Fullick. Aye. Council Member Forbes. Aye. Council Member Bogaz. Aye. 
Aye. Councilmember Purden. Aye. Councilmember Carr. Aye. Okay, very good. Number 11, a draft on fatal memorials. I saw one today out at the uh, element, out at the high school out there. Uh, Fred, this is your uh, item. Can you explain what you want? Yeah, th basically, uh, technically, they're, you're not supposed to do this in the first place. But I think out of respect to people that get killed in a vehicular accident of some type, the, a lot of times the family, sometimes it's close friends, they put a memorial up. I think that there's some wisdom in having a period of time when it's okay for it to be there. And then if anybody complains about it to code enforcement or neighborhood services, then a clock starts and they got maybe 30 days or something to take it down. And then once it's down, if they come back and put it right back up, it can be immediately taken down. Because if you don't want these things to accumulate all over the city because what you're doing is giving a negative image to the city and that we have. That they're not maintained either. Well, and also that we're, that we're, it will appear to some that we may be ahead of, the, of what we really are in the number of deaths. We don't, we have deaths and traffic that all cities have. And we're probably either average or below, but not above. So the more these things that accumulate, the more the image will spread. And the other thing is, after they're up for a while, in many cases, they're not maintained, so then they begin to be an eyesore. So I think it, it, it just makes, it's a way of recognizing people <coughs> being able to do that, which is normal, but also that there's a time limit. I think staff, and put together something with some guidelines that would satisfy everybody here or most of us. And that's that's what it's for. Here we are. Could staff come up with a something? I thought there like was that? a regulation. Huh? Or there was a regulation. Like you, you don't do the flowers. There's a. There is a regulation. Yeah, that it's a certain where they print the name of the person and it's put on. I believe that the state, uh, the, the the state. has a policy, but we, uh, we are unaware of the state policy. roads all. It would fall under our sign code. If I was to say there was a regulation, maybe our right-of-way permitting requirements. So it would technically probably not be allowed at all. Um, but uh, I mean, we can work on If this is something you want to allow for a period of time, it's something we can work on. Just a minute. Uh, possibility of a permit and, and a permit. If they can get a permit? It would not be a permanent type permit because it, it. For a short period of time, I, 30 days? No, no, I think. You guys I, can work on it. Come well, on. I think there's probably examples in other jurisdictions of how they might um, appropriately remove these with some um, w waiting period and decorum. So maybe we can look at some policies. Um, the issue we would not want to look into is this is very similar to. A, a, stick in the mud signs or the the, the, the railway signs it, it's very hard to track down who actually placed the memorial there so what we can do is look at some policies and some guidelines and then our staff might have some direction from council about how it might be a, an appropriate time period where we can either try if we can contact the folks or if there's a way to um, remove it if it's if it's an impediment to traffic or site vision it's a sensitive, sens sensitive issue, for sure. I understand that. Uh, Nigel, do you have something? It, just a concern. Uh, sometimes I drive by those, and they're a great reminder that somebody possibly was doing something wrong and somebody lost their life. On the other hand, I worry about any sort of liabilities that we may incur if we start saying that you can put these up there. Do you staff have direction on this? We'll, we'll come up with something. Some recommendation. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Are we on to uh, let's see. Number amending chapter four. Okay. All right. Twelve. Twelve A. Twelve A. This is the second reading of an ordinance. Well, there is the truck ordinance. We just put this. Yes. Uh, write the ordinance so that we can write the resolution as to. Thank you. 
Correct. So we're, we're going to read the title out, hold the public hearing, see if there's any comments, adopt the ordinance, and then if you guys decide you want to move forward with a, with a resolution designating a particular area of the city, then we'll bring that back at a future meeting. This is second reading of an ordinance of the city of Bonita Springs, Florida, amending the Bonita Springs City Code, Chapter 40, Traffic and Motor Vehicles, and creating a new Article 4, Limitations on Through Truck Traffic, Providing Conflicts of Law, Severability, Codification, Scrivener's Errors, and Modifications that May Arise from Consideration at Public Hearing and in, an and Effective Date. Public comment? Public comment? I received many letters on this. Uh, they want it passed, and I can make a motion that we pass this ordinance. Second. I already had a motion. Fred had a motion. And I'll give them away to you. Okay. Any other comments? Roll call, please. Councilmember Corey. Aye. Councilmember Fullick. Enthusiastic. Aye. Councilmember Forbes. Enthusiastic. Aye. Councilmember Bogaz. Aye. Councilmember Purden. Aye. Councilmember Carr. Aye. Mayor Steinmeier. Aye. Okay, next item. Mobile homes. The clerk would allow clerk. people to build a stick house in a mobile home Correct. area in the same lot size, and but we get an elevation. I have a question about. Could, could we have a reading first? But let's 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 do the reading in, and then staff can introduce it. Maybe they can. Maybe even in the introduction, that'll answer your question. This is a second reading of an ordinance of the City of Bonita Springs, Florida amending the Bonita Springs Land Development Code Chapter 4 Zoning to amend Section 4-555 Use Regulations Table and 4-556 Property Development Regulations Table within the Mobile Home Residential District, <coughs> Section 4-866 General Provisions and Section 4-872 Storefronts and Signage for the Downtown Form-Based Code and Section 4-898 Permitted Uses and Section 4-899, Site Devi Design Standards within the Bonita Beach Road Corridor over Overlay District, providing for conflicts of law, severability, codification, Scrivener's errors, and modifications that may arise from consideration at public hearing in an effective date. All right. Good evening for the record. I'm Jacqueline Gensman with Community Development. Uh, with me tonight, I also have uh, my team uh, Mary Zizzo and Mike Pegon also <coughs> helped prepare these amendments. Uh, just to give you a summary, this item was brought before you about a month and a half ago with direction to pursue these amendments. You did give us that authorization. It was scheduled for the local planning agency um, a few weeks ago um, where they found the amendments consistent with the comprehensive plan. The comments that we received that were applicable to the amendments actually was positive feedback um, regarding the signage for our downtown area. But other than that, I do have a presentation if you'd like for us to go through each section of the code that we are changing, we're happy to do so. I just wanted to kind of get your direction first before we move forward. I think it's pretty clear. I, I, I motion to approve. Second. A second. Any public comment? comment? Public comment? Roll call, please. Council Member Fullick. Aye. Council Member Forbes. Aye. Council Member Bogaz. Aye. Council Member Purden. Aye. Council Member Carr. Aye. Mayor Steinmeier. Aye. Council Member Corey. Aye. Okay, number C, septic tank to sewer. This is an ordinance of the City of Bonita Springs, Florida, approving the petition of Bonita Springs Utilities Incorporated to approve special service charges for Sun Village Estates and the Lakes of San Susi subdivisions and providing for an effective date. Okay, Mr. Mayor, uh, this is just a first reading. Um, BSU will be presenting at the next meeting, but, but we have received correspondence. We've seen these in the past. There's a tariff structure being imposed to allow the imposition of special service charges for the conversion from sewer to uh, septic to sewer in these two neighborhoods. And because that is a change that requires uh, under the franchise, it comes to an ordinance before you. So if you have any comments or anything you'd like me to pass on to BSU ahead of the second reading, I'm, I'm happy to do that. 
to move to second reading. Second. Council Member Forbes. Aye. Council Member Bogaz. Aye. Council Member Purden. No. Council Member Carr. Aye. Mayor Steinmeier. Aye. Council Member Corey. Aye. Council Member Fullick. Aye. Exchange of an easement. Okay, this is a um, Ore Road, northeast corner of 75. Ore Road was an existing city road. Uh, previously, I think in 2009, the, the property owner at the time had a development plan which uh, they requested and the city approved the vacation of Ore Road and the relocation under a new easement. Um, that property did not move forward in development. There is the, the property owner today would like to relocate that again and so what we have is an exchange of easements for a new location uh, and an agreement that they will maintain the existing access to the adjacent property owners until such time as the new road is constructed. Has this been reviewed by anybody? It ha it's been under review for quite some time. This was the uh, Benita 75 development and it was actually approved conceptually by the, by the council at the time of that rezoning. Any uh, public comment on this? If there's any. I move to approve it. The second. Any other comments? Mo uh, roll call, please. Council Member Bogaz. Aye. Council Member Purden. Aye. Council Member Carr. Aye. Mayor Steinmeier. Aye. Council Member Corey. Aye. Council Member Fullick. Aye. Council Member Forbes. Aye. Thank you. Thank no you. other items. Christmas Eve uh, in Riverside Park. Thank, thank you, Mayor and Council. This typically is an item you would see on your consent agenda, but we, we needed to bring it before you because we wanted to make it clear that this we don't typically approve special events on um, holidays. Um, that is a city paid holiday, and it would require a city volunteer uh, to volunteer to work that evening. They would be paid the overtime, but they must volunteer to do that. So um, there is no promise that that would happen. That's why this is uh, for your consideration. Additionally, we wanted to make it clear that um, that during that time, the city permits a holiday stroll, um, and there is music that plays as well, and the, um, the applicant's asking that that music pause, so we would pause the, the public event during that time. Is the applicant going to pay to help? Correct. They have to pay all the fees. Correct. The special event, they pay the special event fees, the rental fees, and they have to pay the cost of the overtime uh, which for the employee to uh, to be at the event to uh, address the music. Motion to approve. Second. Any other comments? Roll call, please. I was no, I was just going to say it's it's Russ Wins Church, uh, and it, they've done this for a number of years, and they're just I, I think it's a turning it off for a little bit to let them do the mass. I think that's a good idea. So. Council Member Purden. Aye. Council Member Carr. Mayor Steinmeier. Aye. Council Member Corey. Aye. Council Member Fullick. Aye. Council Member Forbes. Aye. Council Member Bogaz. Aye. Wireless facilities. Thank you, Mayor and Council. At a previous meeting, count, uh, Council had directed staff to come back with some suggestions regarding the um, the city's wireless facilities regulations, line development code. So I've asked John Dahmer to come forward. Good evening. Good evening. Now we've taken a little bit of time to set this up. Um, we were given guidance to come back and look at the standards for, for cell towers. This was uh, the last major rewrite was back in 2015. At that time, we had uh, made quite a few changes and, and provided a lot more in terms of, of uh, detail than what was there previously. In fact, I think that the previous ordinance was the one that the city had originally adopted back in 2001. So. Uh, this is really the second time we're really taking a look at this and when we've discussed this internally we don't think that there's a lot of glaring deficiencies staff wise in the existing ordinance uh, however there are some things that are in there that the city may want to look at um, <coughs> in your packets I've included the actual ordinance itself 
I also started to try to come up with a cheat sheet. Cheat sheet wound up being like 10 pages, so I don't know how much we've cheated. And uh, we'll just kind of go for a little bit on the, on the presentation to work our way through this. Um, both of those, the ordinance and the, the uh, sheet, can start off with definitions because that's kind of where we're going to, the basis of all of our regulations. And working through those, we looked at the different types of towers to start off with. Uh, lattice tower, guide tower. Uh, this is my own photography over here, so it looks a little bad. But <laughs> Stealth tower. And then I found one that shows a lot of different varieties for stealth towers. They can be in signs uh, or bell towers. This one's supposed to look like a palm tree, but it looks kind of like a Sputnik. <laughs> this is a pine tree that doesn't really look like a pine tree. This is a cactus, which isn't too bad. Flags and, and uh, uh, church symbols tend to also be a very popular use based upon the, the size. Our current regulations, uh, other than when we look at the height and the, and the use definition, but what goes around each of these. So if you have a cell tower, the equipment that is on the ground, usually if it's a co-location, all of the companies that co-locate have a box there for their equipment to be stored. Around all of that equipment, we require a fence to be installed eight to 10 feet in height. <coughs> it's chain link. If an applicant chooses, they can put three rows of barbed wire on top of that. Uh, which is kind of unique because we don't allow too much barbed wire in the city. This is one of the few places that we do. <coughs> and it's not a requirement, it's just an option should they choose to install it. Outside of the fence, we require 10 foot landscaping. Basically, it's a double row hedge with sable palms. I don't remember exactly why we got that in depth with the exact type of uh, buffering, but there's two types of, of buffering that you look at, especially when you start looking at taller structures or taller buildings. You look at what's at ground height or pedestrian scale or vehicle scale, wherever you happen to be driving by it, and then you have that height that's well above that that you almost have to look up to see. For uh, what we landscape around each of these facilities, there is, there's always been a debate as to whether you want to visually screen it from the public or whether you want to provide that open visibility. Uh, certain utilities, like them to be completely open. Other utilities like to have them shielded so the public can't see what's in there. Uh, in this particular case, we require a 10-foot landscape buffer. Uh, in areas that were at fronts residential property, that 10-foot is increased to 15 feet to, to provide that. So uh, what Sir, I, could I just ask you a quick question? Ma'am. Is that OK? You ask me first. Yes, May go I ahead, ask, ask a question. Okay. Uh. Um, do, does the disguise in any way impede the signal and reception? It can, but getting into the details of that is going to take someone with a lot more math knowledge okay. than I have. Okay. So that's really what we're looking at here, and I know that there's been discussion as to whether we keep that idea of landscape buffering and shielding in place or whether we look at maybe a reduced uh, landscape standard. And actually, oh, I thought I had. Ah, so this, what I thought was the only place that I could found, find one that was landscape that had been completely uh, redone by the hurricane. Uh, doesn't look very nice, but it does show that fact that behind that landscaping, the, all of the boxes and all the equipment is there. And I guess it comes to council's pleasure as to the direction in which you're wanting to go. Do we like to shield these facilities? Do we want to keep them from the public view, or do you want to keep them open and have that visibility as a sense of security? You can argue both ways. And this is entirely. I thought we were going to be talking about the height. We are going to get to the height, yes, sir. So <laughs> that really goes through a lot of the pictures that I had, but I know that the whole reason why we're here is to talk about the height. So what we have is a situation that you have all the regulations in front of you where we regulate height based upon uh, use. And that use allows you a certain amount of height by right, and then an additional amount of height should you choose to go through the special exception process. What we have in terms of a regulation is very similar to what other local jurisdictions have. And in fact, in most areas, we're a little bit more uh, liberal in how we allow that height to take place. Estero requires public hearings for any cell tower. Uh, Carrier County seems to 
to be looking to push all of the towers into the right of way and private property towers tend to have a lot more of a hurdle uh, to go through the approval process. Uh, and after looking at it for a while, we're still not exactly sure what you need to do, but it's significantly more than what we have. Uh, Lee County's ordinance is similar to ours. A uh, little bit of a deviation here and there, but for the most part, the, the two are very similar. So if we're looking to make a lot of changes in height, we would be going in a different direction, but that direction is a policy call. And when I say that, that means that you all have been approached by several members of the public that wanted to do something different. There was a discussion as to how things should be presented for this cell tower ordinance, and certain things that are required, just engineering wise, and certain things that are policy. Almost everything in that cell tower ordinance is a policy decision. There are certain requirements that the FCC has and that uh, you, know, you have for aviation in terms of lighting but almost every regulation in that cell tower ordinance is up to you all and it's your perspective as to what, how you want to regulate cell towers. What we've seen is a reduction in the taller towers that we've seen in the past locally. That doesn't mean nationwide, but that just means what we've seen in our office. We have seen a little bit more of a push by companies looking to, to at least kick the tires on what type of a 5G program they can install. And I don't know what we'll see next, but I don't think that based on the history that we've seen, I don't think there's going to be a big push for the taller towers. How, that, how many, there are some tall towers in <coughs> presently. What's the number that we have? You, are they, how tall are they? Yeah, I mean, oh, we have some that are that are over 300 feet. Yeah, I was going to say. That. But most of them are anywhere from the 75 to 150. Okay. Hello, Mike Fegon uh, with Community Development for the record. Yeah, John's right. We, we have towers that span the gamut in terms of sizes. We have some that are co-located on buildings as low as 35 feet. We have some that are located on higher buildings such as 60 or 75 feet. We have some communication towers that range uh, almost 1,000 feet in height. Um, and actually, to, to John's point, one of the things that we actually that we're working through a process right now is an existing 250-foot tower that they want to go ahead and dismantle and put up a smaller, more narrow profile tower in its place. Um, the, the big kind of bulky towers are kind of fallen by the wayside, and that's all with the advent of technology, which, you know, you blink your eyes and the technology is going to change. So that seems to be the trend that we're seeing and where it's headed. Um, from our perspective, our code is set up to deal with that as is. Um, it, it, it's, it's very much self-regulating based on height, so it's, it's a bit more sensitive in the residential areas, which is where you might get the most pushback in terms of height. And then if you're in a commercial, industrial areas, you have a little bit more leniency in your allowable heights. That's the way it's set up now, but we're, we're open to new direction, but it's a policy call, as John said. What is the regulation on putting them on 200 feet buildings? On sides of the building, that seem to be two tennis clubs. There, sure. there's 100, 125 feet tall or something. Like sure. That. Yeah. If, if if it's an existing building, um, and you want to go ahead and co-locate and put equipment on an existing building, that that's an administrative process that we can put you through right now. So there's no there's no public hearings that you have to go through. We do have some requirements for the co-location, such as. They have to be stealth or camouflage in design. So if you look at some of the ones on the beach, such as Beach and Tennis Club, they're painted the same color as the building. The equipment's hidden on the roof. Those types of things are just standard uh, that, we, that we employ throughout that process. Um, but yes, that's a good example of something that we do allow currently. Well, if it's not built in, why change it? Uh, huh? but, but I, I, I will go into that, then not to steal any thunder. I think that there are a couple of areas when we look through this that I, you may want to consider. One is if you do want to reconsider the height that's available to a tower company uh, through the special exception process, that would be something you could look at. We also might want to look at the lot size that's required because right now parcels that are leased or owned by a tower company have got to be able to contain the overall height of the tower. So if you have a 200 foot tower, you have to have 200 feet in property in all directions so that tower can fall. At this point, the way the towers are designed, they don't fall straight over. And if we can have an engineer certify that they can have a smaller area, that would also be an area that's appropriate. But I know, Councilman Corey, you had a couple comments. Yes, well, Chris. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, well, I just got to say the technology 
committee did their report. We, you know, we. The thing that uh, was striking was the life safety issues because we don't have good cell phone coverage in the city. The, the tech recommendation of the technology committee was to raise the height limit up to t 125 feet. And so I don't see anything wrong in doing that. If the tower companies, through the evolution of technology, don't need 125 feet, then the they won't build it 125 feet. But if they do need it to improve the cell phone coverage in the city, then then we've got something in place that will allow it. And people that uh, have to go outside their homes to make a phone call using cell service, or if there's an emergency in the home and they can't get outside, at least we've got coverage uh, throughout Bonita Springs. So. That's my thought. That let's go ahead and do this, and, and you know the techno the tower companies will tell us where the technology is going. And that that being said, I know that we've gone through a number of, of permitted type of towers, but I think that <coughs> when you look at what's available today, and I don't want to tie ourselves too much to the day's technology, but I think that the the stealth towers that they're using today as the monopole tend to be the least intrusive. They're currently permitted under what we allow. And if we want to look at additional height to which they could be provided, that's entirely up to you all. Yes. Yes, Greg. Yeah. <clears throat> Couple things. Number one, on the type that uh, he's talking about, the round cylinder, I wouldn't have a problem if we gave it some slack. The other ones are an eyesore, and they're, you put it up against an HOA, and they're going to be all over your back. But that would be fine. Second thing I want to point out, and if you don't believe me, you need to look at the films that uh, Matt Feeney's got. On the ones that have got guy wires, that distance needs to be longer than the tower because if that cable snaps and it comes off at the top, it's going to go like that. It's already out from the base and it's longer than the tower is tall usually. So it's going to, you're going to have to have a a little bigger lot to handle that. And that's okay because when we look at the, those type of towers, those are, I had to double check to make sure I was right, but those are only allowed in industrial areas. Good. But yeah, they'll cut, cut somebody and in half. Towers currently are allowed anywhere? The, they will pretty much anywhere. They're not allowed in wetlands. VRGR, no. Correct, yes, sir. Those videos for you. Oh, and, and VRGR. But each of those uses comes with an allowable height and also a height that you're allowed to apply under a special exception. Yeah, yeah. yeah, just one question, John. The uh, issue of how we're going to uh, camouflage or whatever, criminals, usually when it's theft, it's opportunity. If they don't see it, they'll go somewhere else. So any recommendations there? Uh, I can argue that one both ways, which means it probably isn't the right answer, or I haven't gotten to it yet. Because I think that there's something to be said. If you see somebody in that fenced area and they shouldn't be there, that's easier to spot. However, if somebody doesn't know what's back there, they don't know what's available. So I guess it would depend on how well it's hidden and how badly somebody wants Smart to Smart criminal it. knows where they are. doesn't matter how well you hide them. I'm just talking about the opportunity of some idiot driving by and saying I could get myself some free equipment. From that perspective, I think that it's better to be landscape. Um, and I know it, that type of thinking was coming on the heels of a lot of things that we had already worked on. It was also uh, right before we started pushing a lot of the, the revisions to the Beach Road corridor, and the idea was is that things are not that are not architecturally designed or architecturally pleasing should at least be uh, shielded with some landscaping. So that was kind of the thinking behind a lot of the decisions that the city had made during that period. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. I'd like to just say it seems pretty broad, uh, our our policy, and so why don't we let the cell towers when there's a demand from customers decide what they want to do and let them build what they want to, you know, and they come in and they get an approval. The only thing I think that we, I might suggest to that would be at this point in time, we limit the amount of height that someone can even ask for through a special exception. And I think that the, the main item, even though the entire ordinance is on uh, before you, uh, the main point would be maybe to increase what could be applied for. Doesn't mean what's guaranteed, 
for which you all have to approve, but it would at least allow somebody to ask for that additional overall height. As long as there's the safety requirements Correct. involved. And I would, I would probably focus that increased height maybe in, in non-residential areas. Mm -hmm. um, that's up to you all, then we take your direction, but, yeah. but commercial industrial areas, maybe we look at some serious increased height. Would that be acceptable? Or? Yeah. I think we could even give flats on the round ones even in residential areas. And that would be fine, but I think we've talked about they probably have a limit to how tall that you can build those and still make them structurally sound. But yes, sir, we could do that as well. We're not doing an ordinance. This would basically be for us to come back with some changes for you all to consider. This would not be a formal change tonight. Okay, Jesse? I just want to say I think it's a great idea, long overdue from a technology standpoint. Um, I think, uh, you know, whether we're talking life safety issues or whether we're talking convenience issues, I don't think there's really any arguing that Wi-Fi could be better in the city of Bonita Springs. So I think that this is a first step toward, toward excuse me, towards moving in the right direction of fixing that. So I'm in favor and I think it's a good move. Okay, you got, you got direction? Yes, sir. And just so everyone uh, is aware that a lot of the discussion that started was difficulties in reception east of 75. And I think that if we, we bring something back, part of that discussion is going to be talking to property owners kind of north of Benita Beach Road outside of the city about possible locations. It's not our jurisdiction. It's not our regulation. It's not our property. However, if you're looking at those areas which are, are poorly served, uh, where towers can be located, really you're looking at within communities. While they can put their own 35-foot towers in those communities, most of them are not looking to do that. Um, so, but, but the Biden administration has an infrastructure grant for underserved um, communities to put in Wi-Fi and, and towers. The, we would have two options when you start looking east of 75, and that is either to locate them within the communities themselves or to locate them uh, generally north of Benita Beach Road and unincorporated uh, Lee County. Okay. Not, not only underserved, but it has to be remote for those grants. So they were about, I, unless someone objects, I'd like to bring at least a little bit of an, a thought on that when we come back. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, how about an update? <laughs> So, yes, Mayor and Council. John, if you wouldn't go too far. John's going to provide you with an update on our Hurricane Ian permit process. Oh. Well, to keep you busy, John. So I have a very ambitious uh, GIS IT person that comes up with new forms and new ways to present these every month and just sends them over to me. So what, what he's looking to do this month is to show you where the trends are going, not so much the numbers. We've seen the numbers. We've kind of looked at them before. But if you look at the number of phone calls and the number of, of emails that are coming in, um, as you can see, we're up on phone calls, we're up on emails. We're down a little bit on people coming in to visit us, and we're, we're down quite a bit in, in some of the restoration and, and uh, permits and, and hurricane permit inspections. Uh, I think that we're nowhere near the end. We're, in fact, I think that we're probably still in the first half. But I think what we're seeing is, is that most of the bigger push is now at us now, and we're going to probably be in a higher level of permit activity <coughs> in some period to come. So. Uh, most of the initial work that people have gotten the, the checks out right away, those permits are probably cl getting close to being complete. Now we're dealing with people that have had issues with insurance companies, people that are financing themselves, people that just couldn't find a contractor, all of those things that prevented them from initially reconstructing, those are a lot of the citizens that we're seeing at this point in time. So I don't know if there's, there's any questions, but at least this provides you a little bit of an idea on where the trends are coming from. Uh, Aida Lonergan is also here if you want to talk about some FEMA questions, uh, but we're here for your and information. I additionally want to remind you all that we are still waiving the permit fees for Hurricane Ian related damage. Okay. Now, in, case, in my own case, uh, Hickory Shores, where's the permit for the roof? 
And John found out the permit was ready, but the contractor had to come in and tell them when they were going to start the work. Or in some cases, they got to come in and pay the fee. Is the fee collected when the permit's done? Well, if it's if it's a hurricane-related permit, they wouldn't be paying our, uh, any of the building permit fees. Sometimes there are other fees that are associated with that permit. That could be a fire review fee. That could be a, a state fee. That we that don't go to the city. Those could still be charged. However, if someone comes in and says my house was damaged, my building was damaged because of Hurricane Ian, we just say deposit your permit in this box, and we'll let you know what the permit number is. There's no fee. And it gets inspected. Uh, the contractor does have to call in those inspections. They, they are given a permit card that tells them the inspections that are needed. And it's their responsibility as they get to those points in construction to call those inspections in. Do, they think, do you think they're pretty good at that or no? We have some that are very good. We have some. Don't bother. Is there a charge for the inspector? No, no sir. There is a charge for reinspections, but because it's a, it's a hurricane, if we're t discussing hurricane-related fees, there is not a reinspection fee. Okay. Anything else? Yes, thank you, Mary Council. Um, to continue on our hurricane recovery information, um, um, our staff members, um, Lisa Roberson, our finance director, as, as well as Ellie Soto um, in Public Works, Special Projects Coordinator, had the opportunity to go to Chicago Thanks to Congressman Byron Donald's office, he opened up the opportunity um, for all the municipalities in Lee County to participate in a, a very important FEMA workshop, which specifically went through the guidelines of Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery. Um, as we move forward with the disaster recovery process and the $1.1 billion that has been allocated directly to Lee County, um, our staff has put together a, a couple of things, documents. We're not asking for any decisions this evening. But the Resiliency Task Force has asked that um, communities, nonprofits, cities as well, uh, I think it's open to all, the, all of the advisory boards as well, to submit uh, projects um, for consideration. What I understand is this is twofold. This process is twofold. As we stated before, um, Lee County has has selected the recovery task force as the outreach uh, advisory board for the HUD program. They are additionally looking at an overall recovery effort for Lee County as a whole. So I understand that these um, the first step in the CDBGDR process is to evaluate unmet needs. It's an unmet needs assessment, and I believe that that will be required sometime before the end of this calendar year, in order to document those unmet needs, the recovery task force is asking for particular projects that might help. Um, what I've been told by Lee County staff is we do not need all of the specifics of the project. Basically, it's a project summary and um, an idea of what the project may cost. There will be an opportunity to amend that cost as more detailed information comes in. There, were, of course, these would have to be reviewed by consultants uh, as well as engineers and architects, depending on the particular project, um, as well as appraisers if it's depending on land acquisition, um, depending on the where we move forward. What I understand is twofold of that is this list will also be used should the recovery task force have opportunities to find outside funding sources beyond the 1.1 billion. And what I've been told is that is a project goal of around 10 billion for all unmet needs of Lee County which is beyond this, this specific allocated funds. So one, a couple of documents we wanted to give you is our staff put together just basically a little bit of the nuts and bolts of the CDBG program and allowable uses. It's um, light reading. <laughs> and then additionally, you have twofold in here. Um, you have the city's community development, uh, I'm sorry, the city's low to moderate income census tracts. You have a map of those. I think we also gave you a larger map as well. And then what your staff has done is taken the current capital improvement projects that are in this budget and map them into potential, into the census tracts to see if there's an overlay. We will still have to look at those and see that they qualify, but um, the, the key here is that we would be looking for projects that qualify as benefiting those in the low to moderate income census tracts, but additionally, um, need resiliency and or experience some form of 
um, some form of disturbance from Hurricane Ian, and we're, we're, we're going to have to work hard on showing, documenting that as well, and we're going to be using all resources to do that. Um, there is one additional project that Matt wanted to offer for consideration, not a decision tonight, but um, that, that he'd like to provide into the map as well. So um, I was going back through our um, not this last budget workshop or uh, yeah, budget workshop for transportation, but the prior year, um, so two years ago, I suppose, that we were, we were looking at it um, for transportation. And we did identify as a long-term project. It just isn't currently in the CIP um, improvements along Pennsylvania Avenue's corridor. And that area, you know, certainly was affected by storm surge and, you know, might be something that you would want to consider. It also... Uh, lines up with some of the low to moderate income area. So, you know, it's not well defined, but it was something that council had um, pointed out as something to look for in the, in the long term future. And you know, maybe these funds can be an opportunity for that. So, what we'd like to ask if we could um, at our next council meeting, um, I believe it's a, it, that one is our 9 a.m. meeting, is to ask for a workshop immediately following that. I would ask that the workshop be advertised so that votes can be. Um, taken so that we have direction to be able to um, <coughs> provide um, the actual intake forms. I've already, we've already looked at the forms and feel comfortable that we can provide them as long as we have got some general guidance. <coughs> but also in the interim, um, please feel free to talk to Matt and myself individually about any ideas of projects you have so we can begin to flesh those out so that we can have some form of um, um, documentation or, or further information on them during the workshop um, and, and provide those. But I, I do want to make clear that it was uh, that I understand is there is still opportunity to add projects as we go through this process. Additionally, the, um, the notice of funding has not been issued yet by FEMA. And once that occurs, you know, there'll be additional times. And then we will also have <coughs> specific projects. So there's um, Right now, I'm understanding that the May 26 date could be pushed back a little bit based on when the issue of the notice of funding actually comes from HUD to us. Um, so that would add more time, but also once the notice of funding happens, there'll be requirements for the submission of the specific uh, projects and we'll have to get approval for those and there'll be a time to add projects at that time too. Lee County will have to uh, provide us with information on how they're going to take those applications as us being a subrecipient as well. Mm -hmm. I was expecting to. Now that we have uh, out, upfront expenses in, in doing this, we got to get for this phasers and this and that. No, for this phase, there's not upfront expenses, but I do. We will be <coughs> coming forward, requesting uh, consultants' help with this as well for the long term. Uh, this is a long term recovery process. These projects are probably a minimum of five to 10 years out. Um, if you recall the Hurricane Irma, we, we received CDBGDR, which we're implementing now, um, basically for only the past year and a half. But so staff will be directing the task force and giving guidance. So to, to clarify, we're asking that, no, no, to clarify, we're asking is council to prioritize your project so that we can submit that on behalf of the council. <laughs> that message, similar to how the MPO is set up, will be if you're unanimous uh, or your, your discussions as council, your representatives are Council Member Corey and Council Member For Deputy Mayor Forbes. So they would carry that message of the council as a whole. Okay, Matt. Uh, I see it. We got the sewer, the manhole cover, the manholes, and then I see a bunch of dips where maybe all that rain has made big dips in all kinds of places all over town in the roads. Well, it's not so simple. It's it, not it, so it, simple. That's I on know. an individual. <laughs> that depends on what's individually going on at each manhole. Um, I would not make the general comment that it had to do with the storm. Um, there's a lot of different factors that cause but that's, elevation that's certainly going to be a problem. You know, they're going to have to dig it up and fill it back up, level it out. But I see that all over town, maybe from the added rain or something. It's it's not a one-size shoe fits all on that. Okay, you know, I've been looking for some money. So, yes, Nigel. Just a question. Is this something that we do, we prioritize our needs 
at the workshop? I think that'll be one of your, your first. I think this is a marathon, not a uh, sprint, uh, despite you know people thinking they have to have everything in. Um, to give you an example, some of the CBDG, probably mispronounced that, DR money, uh, from Hurricane Irma that we received, the, the most recent that we received was a year ago with when the governor came with the big cardboard check for uh, East Terry Street. And that was Irma money through the same funding program. That was many years after the storm. So the, the ask for that project happened a year prior. So that's, what is that, 2019? Or no, not even 2020. Um, so you know, some of this is, yes, we're looking for projects, but I don't think you need to be concerned that you know, come the end of May, you have to have them all figured out. There's I no way. I appreciate that, so it's, it's not prioritizing, it's coming yeah. with a wish list. So, yeah. so what I've heard is that we should provide everything that we could, would consider because this is part of documenting our unmet needs in the county. Okay, sure. A couple of things. Uh, this is a direct HUD grant to Lee County. So the state's not involved in it. This is the first time that I'm aware that's ever happened. The second thing is that the Resiliency Task Force meeting last Friday, we were encouraged, I don't know how many times, to think big. Uh, so it's more than a mapping of what we've got in our CIP. But for example, you know, what would we do with stormwater management if we had an extra $50 million? Uh, what would we do in terms of protecting natural resources if we had another $40 million? So in addition to this mapping, what the challenge is, I think, for council is to think big in terms of what are the, what's the big ask that we could make uh, when it comes to asking for this money. You know, we talk about buy, the buyout program, we talk about our stormwater fees and how we're, how we're proceeding in terms of stormwater management, but what if we had another 40 or $50 million for stormwater? And that's what they're looking for. They're looking for the big ticket items, the big ideas, to, and that's what they're gonna focus their, their money on. So I just encourage everybody to be thinking about what that big big idea is. So. Um, is everyone comfortable with the workshop directly following the council meeting? <coughs> Moving it forward then. Okay, like a mayor and a council report. I'd like to say thank sure. you to Councilman Byron Donalds for bringing folks to Chicago for that workshop. And um, I think there'll be some really wonderful things that come out of it, especially with the team that works on it. And um, uh, we're in good hands with Ellie. <laughs> okay. Amy, you had any for us tonight? Jane. Um, just a quick overview from the fire department. Um, they did receive a state grant it's through the Department of Emergency Management um, for two new um, weather stations that will go on Station 2 and Station 4, um, giving us real-time weather. That's the one on Benita Grand and one on Mango Drive. Um, and Station 7 is coming along, drywall's up, and they are receiving their um, the fire truck hopefully by the end of the month. That's the one on the beach? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well... I mean, the new fire truck is not going on the beach, no. I mean, uh, <laughs> that's it, not at that station. That's station out there on, on New Hickory Island. That's the one that's coming along. It's got the drywall in it, and they're okay, trying to get the guys. It's got it leaning in there. They're hoping they're to get. They're working on it. They're yeah. hoping to get the guys in. Oh, you know, end of the summer at least. Okay, very good. And that up and running. Yes, Chris. Uh, since we passed the uh, through truck. Ordinance, I would like uh, council to, for us to discuss the application of that uh, uh, ordinance to the downtown district uh, and ask that uh, 
staff come back with a plan for the necessary signage uh, to meet with LCSO to uh, figure out uh, the right enforcement action and uh, uh, to present, present that information at the uh, at a future council meeting, but no later than the first council meeting in June. So. Uh, anything? Uh, an item? Yes, sir. No, so Did we, staff got that? Then. Celebrate Bonita was fabulous. <laughs> that, sorry, I forgot to mention it before. I, I think that's a consensus then for, for direction. Mm -hmm. okay. One other thing is uh, Councilperson Carr asked that the Technology Advisory Board uh, research the recycle issues with respect to electronic vehicle. Uh, batteries and I laid at each of your desk uh, the research that the Technology Committee performed uh, or obtained. John Palodian uh, was responsible for that and there is a, a very active recycle market. It's about a $12.5 billion industry right now <laughs> and uh, so these things are not going to go into a landfill or or Interestingly, used EV batteries can be substituted for peak plants by the utilities. Peak plants are those plants that are turned on when the demand for electricity is, is, uh, is excessive, but the used EV batteries can be used to store needed electricity. So there's an active market within the utilities as well. Very good. Thank you. Okay, Nigel. Um, I think we all recognize uh, Mike Gibson, a former councilman. I think he's a friend to everybody. Mike called me last week and asked me to fill in for him at the Oak Creek Charter School over the years. Apparently, he's gone every year and done a presentation to the kids. I thought you guys were tough. 85 third graders, <laughs> they asked some great questions. The mayor, they believe that the mayor should drive a Lamborghini. So <laughs> I wanted you to know that. <laughs> It was a great experience. If you ever get the opportunity, I would suggest you do it. Um, thank you for all approving the Memorial Day uh, with staff, and uh, I know that'll be a lot more respectful this year. Um, I have a question. Before I came on council, when people came up for public comment, we would ask them to identify themselves, but didn't we also ask where they lived? Mm -hmm. Can we stop doing that? that? Okay, I'd, I'd like to see that enforced that when the people that are commenting, if they're a citizen, I want to know. If they're not a citizen of Benita, I'd also like to know. I mean, it, from a perspective of public comment, it's still public comment. If, if, even if they refuse to give it, they're still entitled to it. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear them refuse to give it. They're human. Mm -hmm. They're human beings. Yeah. So. Um, staff prepared uh, some information. I gave a presentation to the Downtown Business Alliance last week, which went really well. And um, when I asked them if they'd mind if I told them all the good things that our staff have done and what we've done as a city, um, all I gave was the good news. And amazingly, people said, why don't you do more of that? So I asked staff to prepare a talking, talking points for me for that meeting. Um, I've got them for all of you. Do I give those to Mike and ask him to pass them out? Or? Pass them all. Yep, yep, yep. So thank you, staff, for doing that. And people don't mind getting just good news and we have plenty of good news to give um, you guys apparently have been doing good work too uh, second thing the uh, Veterans Committee we're very pleased to announce that we have two new members on the Veterans Committee is Ron Perry here he is not oh yes he is sorry so, so a US Army veteran served during Vietnam 1963 to 66 thank you for that Ron and thank you for volunteering for the committee um, and then we have a second, and I think I see him back there. Mr. Flanders, are you here? So Roy Flanders, 31 years in the United States Army. Um, he spent most of that time as part of the CID, Criminal Investigation Division. I'm going to embarrass him now. He's one of the most highly decorated officers in the United States Army. And in 2016, as a resident of Benita Springs, he was inducted into the CID Hall of Fame in Washington, D.C., and when I say that's a small honor, it's not. Unlike the NFL, they don't put people in every year, and the most they've ever inducted in any one year was two people some years ago without doing it at all. So 
Roy, thank you for your service. And if you want to hear some interesting stories, talk to Chief Warrant Officer Flanders. Mm -hmm. um, that's it. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, I, I'm just going to touch on <clears throat> something that Chris said to give you an idea of what kind of big projects they're looking at. Uh, it's pretty clear that one of them is going to be to propose to have the Sanibel Island with their sewage plant expand it so it would pick up a Captiva, which is not, it's all on septic tanks. So that, that's, that's going to be a big money project. I doubt if, I bet it costs more than 50 million. So the, the idea of thinking big is a good idea. It's an expensive project, yes. Yeah. Uh, Jeffrey, I guess yes. that was your, your end there. All right. A um, couple things. Number one, um, I had some folks reach out to me last week, the week before, regarding a, a situation with their chickens, hen, hens, and, the, and there was a, uh, essentially a, uh, I got sent on a fire drill worried that these people were losing these members of their family due to ordinance, and they were very serious chicken owners, and they were very concerned, right? And upon getting with staff and digging into it, uh, the actual chicken ordinance that we have on the books was a, an exploratory ordinance that we put on and we capped it, but then we never did anything with it. So what I'm gonna ask John or whoever he finds is the appropriate person on staff to look at that, <laughs> to, to say, you know, you know what, is, what, is the, what does the ordinance look like and, and you know, what are our options? And honestly, I mean, I'm in favor of getting rid of the, okay, so it was done as an exploratory with a cap of 25. We've been at like 23 for five years. So it's not like if we say the cap goes away uh, that all of a sudden we have this huge influx of chickens or anything. But I mean, from the point that there was something that we kind of teed up and then never really went anything with, I think we just run it to the ground and actually get the ordinance in place. So I mean, having John kind of look at what that might look like I also uh, for the next meeting could be good. She was she really she worried, was right? Oh, yeah. you know, Dude, she, I yes. Oh, yes. So, um, so yeah. Then number two, and this is really uh, number two. I wanted to thank the gentleman in the crowd that Nigel, uh, you just spoke about. That's awesome. Thank you so much for your service, sir. I appreciate that. Um, and then Nigel, also with your, not to be all Nigel praising today, but <laughs> during your comments when you gave this out, like this, like, like okay. So first of all, it's a good idea, right? But to have it utilize it and then be like oh you know what i should give that to the rest of them you know I, I, that's that's how we should think about things i appreciate that uh this will be helpful i'm sure to all of us so i just wanted to give you a shout out for that um and then last but not least uh i had a great call with uh senator pasadomo uh with senator john martin and adam batana and let me just tell you these folks are uh absolute rock stars uh you know you never count your chickens but as of friday when this budget that's already been approved goes through, we can still get the pen, don't get me wrong, but listen to this. When we get to League of Cities, they had $250,000. Guess what? We have $5.4 million now, entire thing funded. So that's a big deal. Friday, when that goes through, we should be popping a couple little champagne bottles over here at the, at the City Hall. So uh, very good news, but that's just a testament to when you have uh, good leaders locally and, and they're motivated, they can really get things done. So I just wanted to give them their, their due shout out because that's, that's a really big lift for us from our budget, 250,000 to 5.4 million. It's a big deal and we won't forget it. We appreciate it. Senator Pasadomo, thank you. Senator John Martin, our new Senator, and, and then Adam Batana uh, for, for bringing it home. Thank you guys. Okay, uh, you got everybody, I'm the last one. Why don't we go home? Thanks folks. Oh, uh, 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 that's right. Oh, oh yeah, I forgot. <laughs> yeah, hey, uh, before you get started, the, uh, you know, we've been waiting the, uh, for you here. <laughs> uh, the uh, senior wait, wait, wait. center, I got a phone Mayor, call wait, on wait, the sorry. Mayor, just, just to clarify, I'm sorry to, to lead on to Councilman Perkins. I, I was remiss, and I did confirm with Hayden um, w that, our, that our ask is in the signed budget as of now, $5.4 million for the golf course project. Um, and thank you all. I know it was a last minute call for everyone to call, um, but we wanted to, we do want to express to Representative Botana, Senator Martin, and uh, um, President Senate 
past Sedoma. I know that her office heard us loud and clear. I've heard that from <laughs> um, our lobbyists as well, from Hayden, that they she got our messages and um, and all of them uh, stood strong for us. So we appreciate that. Um, of course, the, the next process is, is the governor's review. And so uh, there might be additional asks of council for some um, outreach on the next level, and we'll find out when. Of course. Yeah. Now public comment? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. thank you. My name is Joseph Gallagher. I live 10290 Indiana Street. I am a resident, and you can save the information for next meeting, too. <laughs> uh, all right. Thank you for the opportunity again to speak. There are two issues, and the needs for a senior center and affordable low housing for low and moderate income housing. You are getting a whole lot of money, and uh, and you've always said that, that that housing is a big need, and now may be time for action, now that you're having all sorts of money come in. The low-income rental housing can only be done with subsidies. It cannot be done by a, by a market. It's not eligible for low-income tax credits, so you're getting a whole lot of money, so I think that consideration should be done for supporting low-income and moderate housing. Okay, our, our new executive, now going back to the other one, our new executive director is attempting to streamline the process for a senior center, which is also something we're getting a lot of seniors that are gonna be coming here. And not everybody has uh, recreation centers or places where they can go to, to receive recreation or nutrition or anything else. Um, all right, so, so anyway, she, she came to, to speak to various people to see what's, what's required to make it happen. Uh, her conversation with the mayor revealed that he's upset that the names and other personal information of the members for, for our, the, the senior center have not been supplied. Our members have the expectation of privacy, and the information can only be divulged with their consent. We can give the information of those that have consented and the total number of membership that who have not. Okay, the, the needs of the seniors uh, in Dr. Felke's study need to, need to be addressed. Okay, he'll be present at this, the next Wednesday at 9.30 at the Lions Club. So anybody that's, that's interested, let me know and I'll give you an invitation so you can listen to Dr. Felke and find out about the, the needs of the seniors that are in the, uh, that are in the area. Okay, now, now back, back to the other one. Okay, the next item is related to the block grant over $1 billion that Lee County is receiving. 70% of the housing funds need to go to low to moderate income areas. Rosemary Park would be an area that qualifies. I own a house as a 501c3 nonprofit that's been working in that area since before the 1993 incorporation. Okay, we're looking forward to a pre-application meeting to build 11 duplexes on a 2.5 acre site that's next to the 14 house site of Habit Brett Humanity. All right, I, I, I'm gonna dispense with the next 130 seconds, <laughs> minute and 30 seconds. Anybody have public comment? I guess, uh, Alex? Uh, Alex Grant, 11851 East Terry Street, Virginia Springs. Uh, used to be former city councilman here and uh, one of the founders of the city. Okay, uh, what I'm going to talk about is the pro proliferation of weapons of war that can fire 10 bullets per second, used to kill any. Homo sapiens, uh, any people. Uh, as, since I am a former city councilman and uh, somewhat familiar with public safety, uh, I had experience as an advanced volunteer with Benita Springs Fire and Rescue Control District for about nearly nine years, I would uh, propose uh, that we have a city ordinance in Benita Springs uh, uh, to have an <coughs> additional tax of $10 per property owner in the city to be used to collect this money uh, for which would be maybe around a half a million dollars a year uh, to fund the Lee County Sheriff to be used specifically for the uh, 
control of prof proliferation of weapons used uh, to kill for uh, or critically injure uh, uh, a potential group uh, of people. Uh, this would be, uh, I think, beneficial. Uh, I consider these type of weapons that should be restricted use pesticides. I am also a state licensed and insured uh, certified pest control operator and uh, licensed for restricted use pesticides and I consider uh, these type of weapons to be even worse than restricted use pesticides. Uh, and uh, so I would uh, be willing to work with the sheriff in the county on this uh, idea. Uh, maybe we can have a buyback program of these type of weapons or something like that. I, I have, you know, some, something like that uh, in the city and uh, uh, I would, I'm not charging anybody in the city or uh, the sheriff or anything. This is a freebie on my behalf. And uh, I think uh, this is the, to be done on the right side of history. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? Public comment? I guess it's time to go home. You don't have to stay here. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Thank you.